Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, I am well audible to everyone. So we'll be starting at eight. Uh, Prabhakar will be joining shortly. So I would request you guys uh, to share the link within your circle so that more people can benefit from the session. And we will be recording this session, and the recording of the session will be placed over the YouTube channel. Uh, the link to which has already been pinned to the spaces. So I would request everyone, if you are yet to subscribe to the channel, please do that because it takes a lot of uh, hard work and effort organizing these spaces. So you can surely like appreciate our work. Thank you. And also, like, uh, and the the floor will be open for questions. Uh, so please feel free to send in a speaker request, or you can simply type in your questions in the comments so that I can read it out to the uh, to our guest. Yeah, hi, Prince. I can hear you. Great. You are all uh, audible as well. So it's already eight. Uh, we shall start. So, guys, uh, let me take a moment to introduce our uh, guest for today. So, this is uh, third session with Prabhakar. So, previously, like we had one session on catalyst of price performance, and then another session on how to pick earning winners. So, those who are yet to uh, listen to those interesting sessions can surely revisit uh, the recorded sessions over my YouTube channel. So Prabhakar uh, is co-founder and director at Samviti Capital, basically a, a SEBI registered advisory firm which manages PMS and Category 3 AIF. He has got over two, uh, two decades of ex experience. As far as his education background is concerned, he is an engineering grad graduate with a good sense of software and uh, in the past he had worked as a uh, product manager. So from last eight, nine years, he had been like uh, uh, working with Samviti Capital. And uh, today's uh, session would be around uh, the art of portfolio allocation. So Prabhakar, over to you. Uh, I would request you uh, to uh, add to the introduction just in case I missed anything. And uh, then we can uh, like uh, take the opening note around the uh, topic for today. And then gradually we will ask questions and also appreciate uh, if our attendees have any questions so he'll be happy to help on those questions as well and then uh, the most important thing the the session is purely educational uh, no, by no means any kind of buy sell uh, recommendation these are personal views and uh, they may change at any point in time thank you yeah prabhakar yeah thanks prince for that uh, introduction and also for the disclaimer um yeah, so the top idea of uh, allocation is a very interesting one to me. Uh, see, we all have read and I think we are all aware that allocation plays a very important role in our eventual returns, right? Uh, but if we sit and analyze how much uh, you know, uh, time do we dedicate to thinking about allocation, uh, I am sure it is, it is very less, right? In most cases, we will choose a default allocation methodology and uh, spend most of our time on trying to learn about stocks or do research on the sector, read con conference calls, do scuttlebutt. But all of that exercise you know, culminates into how much are you going to bet on a particular idea. And most of the times what happens is after doing all that hard work, we have a very random or a very, you know, uh, uh, default kind of uh, allocation policy. So it is something on which we have not spent a lot of time and energy to come up with an appropriate allocation policy for our portfolio. So, so this session, I just want to share my views you know, uh, on how I think about allocation, right? So I always believe that, you know, uh, I, I am no expert and, uh, you know, uh, there will be a lot of, uh, you know, uh, chinks in my methodology, uh, which, which, you know, I'm sure we can discuss during the Q&A, but I'll just put forth what I, how I think about it, you know, and how, how I have learned over the last several years that I've been associated with the market. So essentially, uh, in my, uh, you know, experience in the market, I've met different types of investors, and I've also looked at a lot of funds. Now, typically, there are two, three kinds of uh, allocation policies that people follow, right? So one, one of the, you know, oldest and the simplest allocation policy that many people follow is to invest a fixed amount in every stock. 
So what these people typically do is that they have some fixed amount, let's say 50,000 or 1 lakh or 5 lakhs. And th- whenever they get a new idea, either from their own research or some friend had stole them or they've seen it on Twitter, they just go and buy that stock for that fixed amount of 1 lakh. So what the problem with this approach is that, you know, what happens is, number one, your individual stock allocation is not at all linked to your overall portfolio size, right? So whether your portfolio size is 50 lakhs or 75 lakhs or one crore, uh, there are people who will just do a fixed size of, uh, let's say, one lakh rupees on every every stock that they buy. So it's a very kind of a lazy and a random approach. Uh, and what happens is generally these portfolios I've seen, these portfolios will become you know, because every time they hear something about a stock or read something, they will keep on accumulating these stocks of one, one lakh each. And the portfolio will become a huge portfolio of, uh, you know, 80, 100, 120 stocks. And essentially, uh, you know, it will end up either performing just like the market, broad market, or it will even underperform the markets. Just that because the portfolio size is so big, uh, you know, people find something or the other exciting happening in the portfolio on a daily basis because one one, one, of, one of the other stock will go up 10, 20 percent. Uh, but at the portfolio level, actually nothing is happening. So so this is one approach which a lot of people follow, uh, which definitely is not the you know right right approach. Right? It's a very lazy approach, I would say. The second approach I've seen is that, uh, which I think, you know, um, maybe... 60, 70% of the investors are today following this approach, which is they have, they perceive their own risk appetite and they identify themselves as an aggressive investor or a conservative investor. So they have, they, they make that decision in their mind that I am an aggressive investor. So I will have a concentrated portfolio. Or they will say that, no, I am a very conservative investor. So I will have a diversified portfolio. So this evaluation, self evaluation of their risk appetite. Uh, and then, you know, uh, deciding beforehand what type of a portfolio you are going to construct, right, is again a flawed approach because let us say, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, you know, you are, you are a small cap and a micro cap investor, right? And uh, just because you feel that you can take the risk, if you have a five stock or a seven stock small cap portfolio, then, you know, uh, very soon you will realize, you know, in a bull market, all these things will not come, you know, uh, you will not come to realize. But as the market turns, you will realize that, uh, you know, you will lose a lot of money and pay a tuition fee and then realize that it was the wrong approach. Right. So deciding upfront that I am this type of an investor and that is why I will have a five stock portfolio or because I'm a conservative investor, I'll have a 50 stock portfolio is again a very flawed approach. Right, because it has no connection to the underlying strategy that you're running, right? Which which I will explain, you know, how how what is the right way to according to me, what is the right way to construct the portfolio basis the strategy that you're running? Right. And then there is a third form of investors also I see who are you know uh, who are a mix of this concentrated and uh, uh, you know uh, diversified approach. A part of their portfolio is very concentrated, but a part of their portfolio is very diversified. So typically it is like they will have some very high conviction stocks, which in which they will bet, you know, in each stock, they will bet 10, 15, 20%. These two, three stocks will make up, let's say 30% of the portfolio, 40% of the portfolio. And the remaining 60% of the portfolio will be made up of 60 stocks with allocations anywhere between half a percent to 2%. So again, this kind of a construct creates a very, very lopsided equation because, you know, you may be highly convinced of a stock's ability to do well, but let us say for some reason, those stocks do not end up doing well and the 40, and the 40% bucket that you have of two or three stocks, uh, let us say for some reason it corrects 20-30%, then to make up that, you will have to, you know, out of that remaining 60%, you will have to have at least 30 or 40 stocks to perform very well to offset the losses you have made in these two or three stocks. So this is a very, very lopsided approach I see in many portfolios whereby some stocks make up a huge percentage and some stocks. So, so if, if, you, if you get the bigger stocks wrong, then you have to get a whole bunch of smaller stocks to perform just to offset this one or two mistakes that you have made.
so these are the different uh, you know two three different approaches i have seen i'm sure some of you can identify with uh, some of these approaches uh, whereby the portfolio construction is either very lazy or the portfolio construction is biased towards what you feel is your risk appetite as a investor or portfolio construction is confused right like part of the portfolio is very concentrated with high conviction bets and part of the portfolio is very diversified so net net you know mathematically it becomes very difficult for the portfolio to balance itself so coming to what what an ideal portfolio construction should look like so my view is that portfolio construction is has to be a function of the strategy that you are running so and and when i say strategy basically there are you know two or three important parameters that you know i look at so one of the parameters is uh, an average stock pick that you make you have to sit down and think okay if i'm going to make a stock pick in my portfolio what is the likely percentage upside i'm going to make in this particular script what is the likely scenario that what is the percentage loss i'm going to make in this script and the third factor is how sure can i be about making money on this script right so to give you an example let us again go back to the small and micro cap portfolio let us say you you are building a small and micro cap portfolio right uh, now the typically for a typical investor a small and micro cap portfolio the gain will be something like uh, you know you are not in the small and micro cap space to make 10 15% returns you are in the small and micro cap space because you want to make 70 80 100% returns or more in each stock but at the same time we recognize that given the nature of the space the losses also that i can make in this particular script are very easily it can be 30 40 50 60 percent in some cases even 80 percent just because i am dealing in you know small stocks which are very volatile and which are very uh you know which 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 move up and down very uh, you know in a very volatile way depending upon how the market is now with this kind of a return expectancy if you go out and you know build a five stock portfolio let us say what essentially happens is you are making two assumptions here one that out of the 600 or 700 stocks that are available to me i am very sure that these five stocks are going to you know do well right which is which is a pretty arrogant assumption and the second is a loss in any given individual script you know uh, will not affect you psychologically right so if you're building a five stock portfolio and let us say you know one or two of those stocks fall 50 or 60% now you will be psychologically in a such a bad shape that you will be forced to take the wrong decisions because you have a five stock portfolio because you feel you are a very uh, you know aggressive investor but the nature of your strategy is such that the stocks that you pick they either go up 100% or they fall 50 60% now with this kind of a uh, expectancy profile you are going and building a five stock portfolio then you are going to be in deep trouble right at the same time the other side of it is let us say you are you know a truly a conservative investor now if you are a very conservative investor and let's say you want you buy the kinds of stocks which are you know very stable in nature right so you you are like the uh, you know you buy the asian paint the hdfc bank lever nestle you want to build a portfolio of these type of stocks which are very robust businesses which are very unlikely to fall 70 80% uh, except during a crisis and even then you can be sure that you know they will come back with the market so if you are building a portfolio of very high quality names then you again cannot make the mistake of you know this is the opposite of what we did earlier right so here the mistake is to go very diversified so if you are buying stocks where the positive expectancy or the return that you are expecting is about 20 25% or 15 to 25% and the downside also is you know 15 to 25% on average now in such a scenario you can afford to concentrate right in such a scenario if you go out and buy 50 60 stocks which belong to the category of the nestles and asian paints and pedalites of the world then essentially you are wasting your time right so because what essentially will happen is your your return expectancy is you know 15 to 25% right so essentially you are better off just going into an index rather than doing this exercise of concentrating with 
uh, sorry diversifying with quality or you know diversifying with names where you can be very sure that you know your hit rate will be very high you, that is the mistakes will be very less because these are very solid businesses uh, and, but and also you know that the possibility of losing a lot of money also is less so in such a cases the prudent thing to do is to concentrate you know right? how much you concentrate is again you know is, is, is open to discussion whether it should be five stocks or 10 stocks or 12 stocks but with a very high quality portfolio the mistake that somebody can make is to go out and diversify massively because that will completely defeat all the advantages that come by running a strategy which you know which is you know which is full proof in terms of uh, the downside protection right so 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 these are the things so you know so it's very important to think about what type of strategy you are running uh, you know what type of stocks are you buying what is your up upside likely to be what is your downside likely to be and accordingly go about the portfolio construction so once this basic portfolio construction is completed you know then of course you know you can uh, do in for each individual stock you can you know do incremental uh, uh, tweaks right so let us say uh, let's again take the example of a you know the mid and small cap portfolio right so in the mid and small cap portfolio let us say you come across an idea which uh, you know which is something that presently has a market fancy right or it is a theme which is doing really well or it is a theme which has an earning tailwind now if you have a 50 stock portfolio for example so instead of doing a 2% allocation you can of course do a 3 3.5 4% percent allocation for those kind of stocks which have the other things lining up but you cannot make the mistake of uh, you know like i said uh, completely going lopsided with the uh, allocation so instead of going from 2% to 4% is is fine but you cannot have a 2% to 20% because the moment you do this 2% to 20% allocation the entire portfolio construction will become lopsided so if you make a mistake in that one stock then all the hard work that you have done in all of your other stocks will go for a toss so so that is how you have to you know you know broadly think about portfolio construction and you have to always think of portfolio construction from a bear market point of view in a bull market any portfolio construction will work right uh, we might call ourselves geniuses but the real test of portfolio construction comes in a bear market in a bear market you have to be able to hold on to your positions and be in a position to uh, you know not allow the market to decide what you should do or not allow your portfolio to decide what you should do you have to be in a position whereby you are comfortable with the allocation psychologically and you are able to you know take the decisions on the respective merits and demerits of that stock so so that is how i would uh, you know uh, complete my opening remarks interesting quite interesting i must say so so prabhakar it's like for, uh, although you you covered all the aspects because uh, every individual uh, is different and their their uh, style is uh, more or less different uh, from others but again uh, those who just uh, uh, i mean initially starting uh, investing so the capital so how they can gradually move on to uh, i mean uh, reaching a perfect or near perfect portfolio allocation what, what's what's the math uh, they should uh, i mean uh, look look for yeah no like i said whether you are a new investor or an old investor doesn't really matter because you know uh, like i said uh, these are biases that we bring to the table what matters is what type of stocks are you operating on right so if you're operating uh, like i said if you're very clear that you're operating on the large cap you know like the examples that i gave you right some of the names like uh, hdfc bank and asian paints and these kind of stocks then you can afford to have just 5 6 7 8 eight of them right so the you know the portfolio construction has to be an organic process it is not something that is pre decided it has to be a process that is coming out of the type of stocks that you are operating in right a, a great example of this is private equity right so if you look at the private equity guys they very clearly you know uh, apply a very diversified approach right because 
in, in, in their case, what happens is because of, the, you know, the expectancy of the gains versus losses, right? Uh, is is so is so you know uh, the spectrum is so wide that uh, they come out and you know create a very very diversified portfolio where they probably own you know 200 300 names and uh, the way it is structured is like that is because you know when you lose your investment goes to zero but when you make money one or two investments can take care of you know all of your other losses so it is very much a function of what type of stocks they are dealing in, which should decide, uh, you know, what is the optimal portfolio allocation. So to simplify, I would say that, like I said, uh, you know, if you are dealing in stocks with very uncertain businesses, uh, where you yourself are uncertain of what are the returns going to be, then as a beginner, always stay diversified, right? So have at least, uh, you know, 20, 25, 30 stocks in the portfolio, right? But if you are sure that you're investing only in the blue chip stocks, uh, uh, you know, where you're very sure of the business, uh, then you can afford to be, you know, a bit more uh, concentrated. Right. So, Prabhakar, initially you, you also had a mention about uh, funds, right? And the fund manager. So, do you see any, any flaws or maybe, uh, I mean, obviously uh, not to name anyone, but uh, what had been your experience uh, when it comes to fund managers and uh, their view about uh, the asset allocation? So basic, uh, sorry, uh, portfolio allocation. So w what, what had been your experience in the sense like... Uh, follow so is is that is universal to both investors and fund managers also or, uh, there is some some uh, uh, something different which which you want to discuss no so i would point out uh, you know like i said you know certain large cap funds right so you have certain large cap funds mutual funds which uh, are uh, excessively diversified because of the regulation or because of the nature in which mutual funds typically operate so a, a big, a, you know, a large majority of the large cap funds are unable to beat their benchmarks or, you know, give you very good returns is because of this reason, okay? because they are forced to uh, own 40, 50, 60 stocks. Uh, and the type of stocks that they own are stocks which don't fluctuate that much, right? So there are stocks where the best case upside will be 40, 50 percent in, in an average case. And uh, the downside will be, you know, 20, 25 percent. So when this kind of a portfolio, with this kind of a, you know, expectancy of gain and losses, you build a very diversified portfolio, whatever gains you're making in, you know, one or two stocks. So, you know, so that is in the current fund management context, I would say that the large cap funds, uh, you know, who are overly diversified, uh, compared to what the type of stocks that they own, you know, I think is is a bit of a flawed method, and that is precisely the reason why they are not able to, uh, you know, outperform the benchmarks. All right. So, uh, when it comes to allocation in trading and investing, you see some difference, or like, uh, would you like to talk about it? Yeah. So, actually, I think. Uh, Traders are, you know, very good at uh, portfolio construction because they have a very, very much, much more clearer view of what is their risk reward, right? As investors, we have a very vague idea about our risk rewards because we ourselves don't know how well a stock will do or how badly a stock will do. Now, traders, because they have these defined stop loss levels and defined, uh, you know, uh, take profit levels, they are in a much better position to precisely construct the right kind of portfolio allocation, right? So if you speak to a lot of traders, they will talk about, you know, how they're able to calculate the position size based on how much risk as a percentage of the portfolio they are willing to take, right? So, so trader, so if you are a trader, then the job is much easier according to me because uh, all the numbers are there for you. You just have to plug the numbers and just execute. As investors, it becomes a bit uh, of a, you know a bit of a difficult job because uh, you know the the return profile is something that is uh, uh, relatively more unpredictable. So you know, so I would say that as an as an investor, we have to in fact 
but you know spend more time in ensuring that our portfolio construction and the you know the type of strategy we are running uh, is 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 matching uh, for a trader that almost happens uh, automatically you know by the way they go about their trading so so uh, prabhakar like optimal allocation is a gradual process or it can be initially i mean achieved uh, if if we are very clear on it yeah i think most investors are better off you know uh, if, if i if i talk about a 20 30 stock portfolio i feel that a number between 20 and 30 stocks is you know kind of the golden mean for most people right which is neither to concentrated nor to diversified and within this i think the key thing is to keep the individual stock allocations uh, you know close to each other now the whole idea is, you know is very important here to understand that if the allocations of you know different stocks within your portfolio are close to each other then any mistakes you know made in one or two stocks can be easily offset by you know uh, some of the other peers in the portfolio right if the allocations like i you know told in the initial example if one stock is 10% and one stock is 1% then you cannot afford to make a mistake in that 10% stock right because a mistake in the 10% stock will mean that you know a small mistake there like let's say you lose you know you lose uh, 10% you know 10 10 percent allocation stock right then to offset that your 1 percent allocation stock has to double just to make up for that so this lopsided allocations within the portfolio have to be controlled uh, you know but essentially i would say a portfolio which you know has 3 to 4 percent allocation uh, you know uh, equally distributed across uh, different stocks is a good way to start Right. and and we if we talk about uh, portfolio rebalance uh, then then how we should uh, i mean go about it in such cases yeah <clears throat> see portfolio rebalance is a very uh, interesting topic uh, but uh, you know it it uh, sometimes what happens is let's say you bought a stock uh, you know you bought a 3% allocation and the stock became a 10 bagger now that stock will become 30% of your portfolio now it's it's very you know debatable on whether you should continue to you know own that one stock at 30% or not and you know uh, if you should diversify away uh, but i i think it's it's a it's a call that uh, you know one has to one has to take depending upon the underlying stock but generally speaking if the stock has organically grown to a high percentage of your portfolio because the stock has appreciated then i think you can let it be and you need not disturb it much uh, however you have to ensure that the starting allocation is never lopsided that was my point of you know the starting allocation should never be lopsided uh, otherwise uh, i think if you have this kind of a 3 4% per stock kind of an allocation and sp- spread it across 25 to 30 35 stocks then what happens is uh, uh you know the rebalancing because you know even if you have like you know a couple of stock which double right the, the allocations won't go really you know haywire so your 3% stock might become 5% or 6% which you generally i feel it's a good idea not to disturb it you know because like this say you know let your winners run and uh, so so it's very important to not disturb something just because it has become a large part of your portfolio purely from uh, price appreciation all right so koshik uh, you can unmute and ask your question please uh thanks prince hi prabhakar sir i just wanted to understand uh, what if someone who is a newcomer to the market he's coming with very very small capital and uh, uh, he is having very very small capital as well as like he is just he's not able to do uh, great research on like Alice is doing well for one stock or two stocks. So, how about for him? What kind of portfolio allocation that you recommend for him? This this person. See again. Uh, see the right thing to do, you know, is is to divorce the portfolio allocation methodology from the size of your capital, right? Now, the problem with this small investor, small capital thing is that, you know, people unnecessarily take a lot of risk in the market. and they actually end up uh, you know it's like a, like what they call in options trading nowadays right a hero or zero kind of a mentality right so either i will 
so i am coming with a small capital so i will just go you know uh, all in uh, or you know uh, i will not participate at all uh, i feel even with a small capital right i am assuming that this investor you know is starting with a small capital because is new to the market but over time this investor plans to add more capital as you know they earn more from their salary and as they get to learn more about the markets and over time that portfolio will grow right so the starting capital even if it is small i feel it's important that they follow the right principles because what happens is if you start with the wrong principles right in the beginning with a small capital then when you keep and let's say it's a bull market right and and your small capital grows and you know you do well but because your concepts are wrong what will happen is at the exactly the wrong time you will bring in four times of your original capital and you know lose a lot of money unnecessarily so whether your capital is small or big i would say the same thing figure out the what type of stocks are you buying if you are buying large cap stocks you can you can be a bit more concentrated but if you are buying uh, let's say you know small cap stocks and mid cap stocks then it makes sense to be fairly diversified at best what this investor can do is instead of going for 20 or 30 names maybe they can stick to 15 or 20 names so that is the best they can do but i would not suggest that just because the capital is small he goes out and buys only two or three stocks so so the statement uh, prabhakar lesser the capital higher should be the churn do you straight away agree with this or uh, there are some nuances to it uh, so as to understand no i mean i don't i don't really agree with it uh, so i'm not sure where that statement came from but uh, the see that's why i'm saying right it's a it's a mistake that a lot of investors make that just because the capital is small doesn't mean you you have the license to do all sorts of uh, you know speculation and wrong uh, wrong ways of investing like i said the capital is small now but hopefully this guy you know or, or you know this person who is investing will add money over time and will become the portfolio size will become meaningful as they learn about the market so it is important to divorce all this capital business right at whether i am a small investor or a big investor and focus on the real principles which work in the market so you know whether it is small or big has no connection to uh, you know whether there should be churn or not right now if churn is there then it's a type of strategy you are running right so churn is a is a function of the strategy you are running maybe you are you have a trading mindset and you want to churn it right you want to uh, you know uh, rotate your capital so accordingly then you can define your portfolio allocation you can define your uh, strategy you can define your stop losses and all of that it right? but uh, just because the capital is small you should not gravitate to a particular way of trading which is not in sync with uh, you know what you want to do or what fits with your personality all right agree yeah koshik you can go ahead uh yes sir i just have another question which is very personal uh, which comes on like uh, when it comes to you uh, any client in a different point of time and uh, are you following uh, the same stocks and the same strategy of 4% allocation for 20 stocks or any uh, do you change as per his risk profile uh, in that moment or you do go for the same companies and the same allocation style no see the risk profile is defined uh, you know beforehand right so when a client comes to us we we divide his money between you know two portfolios right one is a large cap slightly large cap portfolio and one is a mid and small cap portfolio right or more a multi cap portfolio so the risk management is done there but once he has come let us say somebody allocates 50 50 so 50% has gone into the large cap bucket and 50% has come into the mid and small cap bucket now within the mid and small cap bucket it is going to be the same strategy and same stocks for everybody and the same allocations right so it will not change the risk management cannot happen uh see once you have entered the mid small and micro cap kind of uh, uh, you know uh, strategy within that now you cannot try to do risk management it will completely you know that is where people go wrong right so you have to decide okay I, if mid and small cap is too volatile for me then maybe instead of putting 50% of your capital you put 20% but once you have allocated that 20% you have to be true to that strategy and true to the kind of uh, returns and the risk that you have in a mid and small cap portfolio so you have to be okay to take a 30 40% loss and you have to be okay to 
make a 100-200% gain. Right? So the risk management has to happen before the strategy, not within the strategy. All right. So, Prabhakar, there are many people like uh, who who uh, subscribe to advisory reports, and on the basis of which they make their investment on their right. own. So, what what would be your suggestion on the portfolio uh, allocation part? As in, like uh, uh, the advisory, although mentions that uh, they have this and that conviction, say you can allocate three percent, five percent, four percent, whatever it be, right. right? But what what do you? I mean, and also like the names uh, of the companies which they recommend comes uh, intermittently, right? right. And not uh, all at one time. Right. So in that case, also like how the investors advantage in, in case of allocating them. Yeah, one of the mistakes I've seen with people who follow this advisory calls and all of that is that they pick and choose the calls, right? So if the advisory person is giving him 20, 20 stock portfolio, what a typical investor will do is he will pick the five or six stocks that he feels he is convinced about. And uh, then they will go about allocating in only those five or six stocks. And when those stocks don't do well, then they go out and blame the advisor, right? So it is important to, uh, you know, when you're following somebody, you have to go all in, right? So like I said, the risk management has to happen pre-strategy, right? Which means that if you are not very convinced about a particular advisor, or you're not very sure of how that performance will be, you allocate less money to him. But you have to buy those exact 20 stocks that that particular person has told and not pick and choose. So that is point number one. To answer your question, uh, you know, I said this because this is a mistake that a lot of people make, whereby they pick and choose you know, from what the advisor is saying, and they don't take a portfolio approach. And then the returns that the advisor actually publishes differs from what this person has made because he has done his own, uh, you know, Mitch Masala on top of that. So, so this... Once you've decided to follow all the 20 and the advisor might be saying that I have high conviction in this, high conviction in that and all of that, I think it's a prudent strategy to go equal weight, right? Uh, on, on all the, you know, 20 names that the advisor has given. If the advisor has, you know, himself uh, constructed a very lopsided portfolio, then, uh, you know, uh, as somebody, you know, who is just blindly following, I think it makes sense to ignore that and just to do an equal weight thing, uh, I think they'll be much better off, you know, and it will avoid any of the biases, uh, you know, that, that come with the advisor's recommendation. Right. And uh, Prabhakar, like the averaging up and averaging down thing, so do you uh, consider this as a part of strategy or uh, does it happen as such? I mean, uh, what's your sense on that? Can you repeat, Prince? I, I missed that. So basically, averaging up or averaging down your uh, position. So right. So so that is again a part right. of uh, strategy or uh, like uh, portfolio allocation. I mean, how you see it exactly? No, averaging up and down is not uh, portfolio allocation. Uh, you know, it's not part of the portfolio allocation strategy. It is a part of the strategy that you are running, right? So there are some strategies where you pyramid up, right? Especially traders do this, right? They, as the you know the stock goes in their favor, they keep increasing the allocations, right? And uh, there are some strategies which will uh, you know uh, buy everything upfront, right? So I think uh, it's it's more specific to the strategy rather than uh, you know uh, how you should construct the overall portfolio. And uh, Prabhakar, I myself feel uh, this this thing in the sense like uh, the the money inflow, the cash flow to invest is say une uneven, right? Uneven in the sense like at some point in time, say I have uh, fifty thousand bucks, and at any point in time, say I have two lakhs to invest, right? So mm -hmm. in in those times, like how one should uh, uh, I mean uh, tackle the situation? Like people have an urge so as to invest whatever money they have at that point in time. So should they wait or like how how this they should sail through uh, this this difficulty? What should be your advice in the sense key? Uh, what is the best uh, placement with this situation? See, in my experience, right, every every few months there is a small correction in the market, right? It is it is the nature in which the market moves, whether it is a stock or the market in general. 
there will always be an up move and then there will be a you know there will be a pullback and there will be a small consolidation and then there will be the next up move so this is how markets move right so having have i mean if once you once you know this right so i i, I always feel in in such scenarios the best approach is to make a you know small you know make let's say 20 25% allocation up front and then uh, you know have patience and wait for that correction but you know uh, one thing is very important you know when the correction actually comes you have to put in mechanisms in place to ensure that you know that money goes in because when a correction starts coming people will keep postponing the investment waiting for the markets to fall more right and that is precisely why uh, sip works so beautifully right i'll give you an example we have certain customers who do very large sips in mutual funds right so uh, the this person right so his uh, he, he does an sip every uh, every day in fact right so there are some funds which accept daily sips so he does an sip every day into the market it's a pretty large sip per month now the difference between the returns of this person and another person you know is 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 huge right so now if the nifty has returned let's say the large cap stocks have returned 12 13% cagr now this person investing in uh, you know index funds has an 18% cagr and the reason for that is during covid right during the covid fall when nobody had any courage to put even one rupee into the market this money was automatically going in automatically going in right and this happens every time there is a correction in the market the sip investor is actually putting in money without you know uh, their interference because if the interference is allowed then that money will not go in and that ability you know of having bought during a correction you know it really gives you a large alpha you know an alpha much bigger than you can get from stock selection so so this is a very important statement you know and i i can repeat it for you the alpha that you get from buying during corrections is much higher than the alpha you will get from stock stock selection right so what what it means is that if you have an expert investor right who is very good at stock picking and you have a layman investor right and this expert investor picks his stocks but doesn't invest during corrections and a layman investor right he typically just invests in a standard set of portfolios but he top up stops up big time during a correction then the layman investor can easily beat the you know the, the great stock selector you know uh, time and again time and again so so whenever you have a lump sum i think psychologically you can put 25% just so that you are you know that urge you to you know not be out of the market is taken care of and the remaining money has to wait for a correction a, you know a, a 6 to 8% correction is very normal it keeps coming every few months i think we have just started one you know now and uh, you have to then go in and use those corrections to deploy the remaining money without waiting for a covid type of fall to happen every 6 months right yeah koshik you go ahead then uh, we take another speaker yeah uh sir i just another uh, it just came up to my mind while you were speaking uh how about if a new client is coming today and like uh, it is the same series but uh, do you think today the valuations of the all the companies is like we are in bull market and the valuations are pretty high so you wait you time to try to wait and then put the allocations back to the companies or you just go okay today the cash flow has come to me and let me go and allocate what, what do you do though in these situations no i no i will not allocate everything on one day like i answered in the previous question i will let's say allocate one fourth or one third right away okay when the when the capital comes to me and the remaining i will typically wait for you know a small corrective phase now i am like i said again i am no expert to be able to predict when the next you know 20% fall will come but i am sure that uh, Six to eight percent fall is definitely going to come in the next, you know, in the next few months, and that is true at any point in time, right? A lot of times you are already in that corrective phase when the capital comes. So if you are already in the corrective phase, then I will speed up the deployment, uh, you know, a bit more. Now let us say a capital came to me yesterday or day before yesterday, right? So then what I would do is I would put, let's say, one fourth of the capital or one third of the capital, and the remaining I would, you know, wait for a small correction in the market. and then you know go go out and uh, deploy the remaining capital 
see this valuation business right this it's very tricky right because see in a bull market uh, like you said like you called it a bull market right so a bull market uh, valuation and this, i'm talking very practically right so there is one is your textbook theory and one is actual you know actually deploying money in the market right so if you look at any of the bull markets right the valuations are always out of whack so if your underlying premise is that it is a bull market then you have to be willing to pay a bit more than normal right so whether you know a lot of people will probably disagree with me on this and a lot of purists and you know will disagree with me on this but that is the if you really go out and study the bull markets of the past right you will you will see that uh, bull market valuations are always on the higher side as long as the bull market lasts you know and the valuations start to compress only when the bull market ends and at that point in time you don't want to be in the market right so you have to keep these small nuances also in mind and not uh, you know be because uh, you know if this bull market is going to last let's say for another 2 3 years then if you look at if you t- look at it only from the valuation vantage point then you can you know you can be staying out of the market for the entire uh, phase of the bull market Any, any uh, uh, Prince, can I go for another question? Add on uh-huh. to this. Please, please, please. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, how about, uh, for example, you have selected some stocks some currently uh, three years or four years back, and that uh, you think the potential is completed, but the client uh, portfolio is coming to you now. Uh, to, uh, for example, he, he is he, is the new client, and uh, the client has been referred by another client. how about what call do you take it because uh, do you uh, stay different to each and every client on the individual basis or in the long run you are going to mirror the everything is the same no see you have to mirror uh, you know you have to mirror for different clients more so because you know it's very difficult to you know see you have one set of best ideas at any given point in time now for five different clients i cannot create five different sets of best ideas right so it is eventually it is one portfolio right and the way you know i am running my portfolio or the pms is that like i said there are two buckets right so one is the large cap bucket which you know is uh, you know more like a core portfolio kind of an approach where well established businesses we buy them you know whenever uh, you know we see some sort of an earning tailwind uh, or we see that there is some one time crisis and we expect a mean reversion you know in valuation to happen the other portfolio is something in the mid and small cap space that i operate is more you know it's a it's not a buy and hold forever kind of a play so i am not trying to play the 3 4 year kind of a game so my portfolio typically you know i'll i'll own a stock a typical stock i'll own some stocks i might own longer and some stocks i'll own shorter but a typical stock i will own for let us say 3 you know two or three quarters or three or four quarters right so the portfolio continuously gets you know refreshed because i am continuously looking for ideas new ideas whether are fresh earning tailwinds you know i am trying to get rid of stocks where the earning tailwinds have play, played out the re-rating has happened and there is very little incremental alpha on the table right so the since the portfolio keeps getting uh, you know refreshed uh, you know every quarter brings a new opportunities for the kind of strategy that i run right now this may not work for everybody but every every result season is is you know is a season of opportunity for me whereby you know maybe 15 20% of my portfolio goes out and new ideas come in right so so whether the client uh, you know so the this idea that you know some portfolio has become old or fully valued you know that that in my case does not last beyond uh, you know 3 4 you know or 2 2 3 or 3 4 quarters so that problem i don't generally face And to answer your second question, it's the same portfolio for all because I believe that at any given point in time, you can have only one set of you know best ideas. You cannot have multiple sets for different clients. Right. So, Vardi sir, you can unmute and uh, ask your question, please. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. No, I am a long-term technical investor. Okay. My decisions are hardly four to five. a year see only long term chart pyramiding only in profit with a strict stop loss in loss my stock allocation is not more than 15 stock 5% all allocation 
raise 25 percent for pyramiding only in profit correct sometimes my two stocks become 35 percent of my portfolio how to ta tackle this thing psychology no i think uh, it's a, it's a good thing right it's a good thing that uh, stocks are becoming such a big which means you you are you know which means your strategy is doing very well but like you explained right so you are a you are a technical investor right so you you follow you follow yeah. technicals right so and you only you said you you are a long term technical investor which i am assuming that you look at weekly or monthly charts right no no yearly charts oh so. yearly charts okay all all the better you look at yearly charts right now yeah. uh, see i think uh, this is an analysis that you can do right so uh, see like they say right trees uh, don't grow to sky right so uh, in case because because you are a technical investor right if you do this study right typically uh, a stock can continuously go up for uh, you know maybe 3 4 or 5 years right uh, this is this maybe you are an expert in this so you should probably go back and study this but you know if if yeah. you have a 30% allocation to a stock and the stock has already gone up let's say for more than 5 years or more than 4 years right and if if that number you know so it so the stock is essentially very extended right now very very rare kind of stocks will continue to go beyond that period you know or will continue to rise for uh, you know uh, 10 15 years and all of that so i'm just i'm just taking a number a random number here called 6 years right so if your stock has gone up continuously for more than 6 years i think you can uh, you can you know prune your uh, allocation but let us say you are in year 2 of your uh, you know uh, strategy and uh, your stock has gone 30% then you should definitely retain it because uh, you know the expectancy is that on an average the stock can go up for 5 6 years so i think that is how i would uh, look at it if i were following your strategy uh, one more thing just a uh, uh, question see adfc bank infosys right asian pay um, or uh, ajash finance right are once in a decade phenomenon correct and everybody follows these things correct it is a what you can say psychologically every investor uh, every fund manager or a, any analyst will show that return correct but uh, there are how many people who are holding LDC Bank since 1995 or 96 or Asian Paint or Infosys or Bajaj Finance uh, after 2009. So uh, I think uh, uh, you are a better judge. Acceptance of defeat is more important than anything else. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. But what is the question? Question is, uh, how long we can uh, say uh, Bajaj Finance was a, uh, I don't remember, 200, 300, 400 around um, uh, demerger of Bajaj Group. Right. There will be a very minute percentage hmm. who are still holding Bajaj Finance. Okay. So psychological parameters will come in between that because market is going up and down. Correct. So how to tackle these psychological parameters? No, see, you answered your own question, right? So you said that stocks like Bajaj Finance, HDFC Bank, Asian Paints are very rare stocks, right? They are stocks which come right. once in a decade, right? So, right. So these are so so that that's exactly what I you know answered your first question that whenever you see a stock. A uh, normal any any no. stock, let us say, which is continuously going for more than let's say six seven years, right? Then right. you have to you know go by the law of uh, you know the base effect, the so-called base effect, that it is not possible that you know uh, every every stock can continue to go up for year after year for multiple years beyond a point. So once a stock has been extended right. for let's say more than you know five or six years then you have to cut the allocation as a part of your process. And I'm not saying make it zero, but you cut the allocation 
and uh, you know you will still be left with the bajaj finances and the asian bands of the world albeit with a slightly lower allocation but at least you will be able to hold on to them without any fear so that's how i would do it great answer. thank you very much very rarely uh, people will answer this question hats off to thank you. you thank, thank you, you very much so so prabhakar i am not sure uh, why i am not getting the request i see 57 uh, pending request but i cannot see anyone uh, whose request is visible to me but again uh, holistically we we are like uh, covered most of the questions i had in my mind so any anything which you uh, wanted to discuss around the topic and uh, yet to uh, discuss or maybe i forgot asking you yeah i mean nothing nothing in particular but uh, yeah i would you know i, I said this in my last uh, you know uh, i think discussion also right uh, people like i said right for portfolio allocation you have to understand what strategy you are running right most most investors i meet do not have clarity around what is the setup that they are you know trading or what is what is their investment strategy you know that that crystal clarity of thought is not there and that absence of that you know clarity of thought is what leads to confusions in this portfolio construction confusions in the buy and sell decisions confusions in uh, you know whether you should pyramid up or not so i think it's very important that we as investors sit down and be able to write on a piece of paper you know very clearly that okay what is my strategy you know which where am i going to operate am i operating in the uh you know growth space or you know am i am i a value investor or am i a momentum investor am i going to operate in the large cap space or the mid cap space or the small cap space what is my universe right what what type of stocks am i looking to buy what type of return am i asking for from each stock you know what type of risk am i willing to take on each stock you know uh, so if you have you know and you know what will i do in term in during corrections when will i add new money into the market the all of these things have to be thought through right which is very rare so people don't uh, you know see people work so hard to earn the money but when they invest it they invest it you know just based on their whims and fancies right so they don't really spend enough time on thinking about you know the process you know thinking about uh, uh, you know each and every aspect of the process and all of these are very simple things which you know all of us can do so i would urge everybody to you know go back and really write down on a piece of paper you know in every you know situation how are they going to act what is the strategy that they follow you know what what triggers their buy what triggers the add what triggers the sell you know you you need it need not be perfect and you can always change it but having that mental clarity you know will really uh improve your returns manifold you know whether it is portfolio construction will automatically come out of that you will not need somebody like me coming and giving you you know a talk for one hour it will automatically come out of the kind of strategy that you are running and also you will not have to depend on anybody to answer your questions on what you should do with a particular stock you don't have to run on twitter or ask somebody or ask some advisor so if you have that clarity uh, you know it's it, it's worth everybody's time to develop that clarity around their setup and around their you know process uh, and and if people do that uh, i think uh, that itself can give them a reasonably large alpha so so prabhakta just like you said uh, investing in corrections uh, is a way to create alpha so uh, we we can also draw a parallel like when when there is euphoria that time we should also be booking uh, profits as well right or uh, it, it's very subjective as in like how the uh, company theoretically theoretically it is correct theoretically it is correct but practically it is very difficult to do buying during corrections is much 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 more easier then selling during euphoria because uh, you know the madness of the market during a bull phase right so so what the best of the investors do right so they change their uh, persona from an investor to a trader like right? if you read rakesh junjunwala or radha krishnan damani ji or you know all of these great guys right and if you read what they have said you know once the bull market goes into a euphoric phase right and uh, you know i don't know how many people here have seen the euphoria i can see a few names uh, like prashant and all which i am sure they've seen many cycles but uh, you know uh, 
euphoria is was that you know 2000s you know you know 7 8 you know kind of a thing and also to some extent what we saw post the covid the bull run that we saw yeah especially in the us right where every day stocks are going up and you know no matter what the stock you know no matter what the news you just the portfolio is going up by 30 40% you know in a couple of months right when that kind of a situation arises p- people have to change their strategy almost overnight uh, you know and they have to become like a trader right so they have to then forget about the investing concepts of buy and hold and you know if you're lucky to be in a stock which has gone parabolic then you have to start getting into stuff like a trailing stop loss or you know uh, or selling into strength and you have to get all of these trading concepts coming into play and only then will you be able to take advantage of a euphoria in as a pure investor you cannot take an advantage of the euphoria uh, you know even somebody like you know uh, buffett right so he was not able to sell coca cola at its peak whether it was right or wrong to sell coca cola is a different question but i'm saying during euphoria if you want to sell then you have to change your you have to be have the ability to change your personality from a investor to a trader and uh, you know and and that is how you can manage that last leg all right so prabhakar one question before i allow vivek shrivastav ji and if i remember correctly he was the person who introduced you to me and i'm very thankful to him that we are doing third session because he he acquainted us hi vivek yes, okay you can go with yes. you first first good evening prabhakar ji and others good evening good evening hello am i audible good evening yeah yeah i can hear yes uh, uh, are there periods when investors should be out of the market Do you think so? Uh, I Vivek again, again. Your voice broke. Hello. Can, can you please repeat? Yeah, Vivek. Uh, are we audible to you? Yeah, I, I heard the question. I heard the yes, question. I'm. I... Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 Vivek. Yeah, Vivek. That's so, my first so, question. Yeah, And can... can I ask the second one also? Sure, sure. हेलो विवेक जी आई गेस हम आपका क्वेश्चन सुन नहीं पाए तो यू कैन पुट योर क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन राइट सो ही आस्ट वेदर इन्वेस्टर शुड शुड बी आउट ऑफ द मार्केट यू नो एट एनी गिवन पॉइंट इन टाइम अगेन लाइक लाइक द प्रीवियस आंसर राइट थियोरेटिकली येस बट प्रैक्टिकली आई आई थिंक इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट right because uh, the you know these see typically investors uh, uh, you know i know so many investors in 2008 who were able to get out uh, you know uh, quite early you know before the fall but uh, none of them were able to get back in you know in, in time right uh, now what happens is uh, it's it's again a play of psychology right so if you if you have exited the market at the right time Uh, then you are on a high right you, so you it's very you know you think that you you've been able to time the market uh, you know on the downside and uh, typically what happens is uh, there is always this resistance to put the money you know back to work uh, you will want to wait for you know because you know some sort of a clarity to emerge typically what happens is you were able to predict a crisis or the extent of the crisis you know before the fall so and that is when you got out and now you try to predict when the crisis will get over right so you look for data points as to when this crisis will get over but typically what market does is and we've seen this in covid also and uh, you know to some extent in 2009 also that the market is always uh, you know is always one step ahead right one step ahead of the news so you know so by the time uh, clarity on you know that the fact that the crisis is over is comes out right the the stock market would have completely uh you know reached uh, you know levels uh, at which at which uh, you know this people who are sitting out will not be in a position to get back in right so if you have been able to get out at the top you are still better off right but like i said earlier the worst mistake that any investor can do is to sell you know a large part of their portfolio when they are inside a bear market because that is a loss that is very 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 difficult to recover right 
a lot of people once the market has already corrected 15 20% and stocks have already corrected 20 25% out of panic they will sell out and then they will say i will wait out of the market i will wait for clarity to come but the cost of you know that clarity and the cost of that psychological comfort is very high because the market will not give you a chance to come back in only theoretically when you see the charts you can say that okay i could have exited here and i could have come back in here but practically things happen so fast and the news flow is so bad while the market starts its you know rally back up that practically very very few investors maybe exceptional investors can do this but an average investor should never try to be completely out of the market a 15 20% cash position is okay uh, you know but but you know something somebody sitting out completely out of the market is something which will all, almost always end very badly okay thanks vivek ji aap second question bhi pooch sakte hain you were saying yes yeah, second question ye tha prabhakar ji ki kya aap multi year low बाइंग थियोरी में विश्वास रखते हैं जनरली मैं देखता हूं आप एक जब स्टॉक गया है कोई थीम नया हाई बनाता है उसी में आपकी थियोरी मैंने देखी है जो कुछ लोगों का मैंने देखा है वो मल्टी ईयर लो पर कोई कैटलिस्ट आता है तो बाई करते हैं हाँ इफ सी मल्टी ईयर लो पे अगर आपका कुछ सेक्टर में एक्सपर्टीज है देन डेफिनेटली यू शुड डू इट नथिंग बेटर देन डूइंग दैट बट लॉट ऑफ पीपल क्या होता है कि मल्टी ईयर लो जस्ट बिकॉज इट्स मल्टी ईयर लो फिफ्टी टू वीक लो पीपल से इट्स वैल्यू स्टॉक एंड दे गो एंड बाई इट दैट इज नॉट अ राइट स्ट्रेटेजी राइट सो इफ सो इट हैज टू बी अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ अ मल्टी ईयर लो एंड यू आर एन एक्सपर्ट ऑन दैट सेक्टर विच मीन्स दैट यू हैव सीन मल्टीपल साइकिल्स इन दैट सेक्टर नाउ आई नो सेवरल इन्वेस्टर्स हुआ एक्सपर्ट्स इन प्लेइंग कमोडिटीज और प्लेइंग मेटल्स दे नो दैट वो वेदांता का स्टॉक वो सेवेंटी एटी पे बाई करना है और डेढ़ सौ दो सौ पे बेचना है राइट सो बिकॉज देव प्लेन प्लेड दैट साइकिल मल्टीपल टाइम्स एंड दे नो हाउ हाउ इट वर्क राइट सो इफ यू आर एन एक्सपर्ट इन अ पर्टिकुलर इंडस्ट्री और अ सेक्टर ओनली देन गो गो एंड डू दिस बिजनेस ऑफ बाइंग एट मल्टी ईयर लोज और यू नो फिफ्टी टू वीक लोज बट इफ यू आर एन एवरेज इन्वेस्टर देन आई वुड नॉट रिकमेंड दिस स्ट्रेटेजी and uh, you know uh, and it's not that i will only buy stocks which are near all time highs or 52 week highs uh, which uh, you know uh, i would also buy stocks like you said which are near the lows but where there is a clear catalyst which tells me that the earnings have already started to turn around the only difference between me and some of the more sophisticated investors is that some of them are able to predict the change of the earnings cycle before it happens i typically even if i can predict it i am not so confident in my ability so what i do is i wait for at least you know one quarter of numbers to come out of course i get i get to buy the stocks uh, you know uh, 20 30 40% higher sometimes but i prefer that than to predict that the you know demand cycle is going to come because i know several uh, instances in 2018 to 2000 uh, you know that 2018 19 period when several marquee investors right they bought into companies anticipating that the demand is going to come back right so they were preempting the market and those stocks they went nowhere for the next several years and in fact have started rallying now a lot of infra companies i remember a lot of uh, capex companies because all of those companies were trading at very low valuations and they were you know trading at uh, utilizations which were at multi year lows because you know no capex was happening nothing was happening but you know uh, it took you know it took 2 3 4 years for all of that to get ironed out and finally for it to you know show in the earnings and that is when the market you know started re-rating them so this preempting business at 52 week lows is something that i would not do uh, but i will not be averse to buying at 52 week lows or near 52 week lows if i see a turnaround in the business in terms of earnings which are delivered right any any Thanks. further question vivek no no i generally i ask it for commodity purpose and he answered it well thanks thanks thank thanks you. again vivek so uh, 
Preet is asking, Hi Prabhakar, I am an ardent fan of your earning setup and I really read your subtracts. Over the few posts, you said you will look at how to read results and charts in tandem, which should help you make more sense on how markets operate. When are you going to share about this setup? Yeah, I mean, there is nothing. Uh, I will I will eventually try to do some, you know, Zoom call or something. But see, there is nothing. I mean, there's nothing out of the ordinary. It is not my invention. See, uh, it's basically the fact is that markets are always looking for a catalyst, right? So the key, the key edge is that the catalyst can come in the form of news or in the form of, you know, earnings. And I typically follow the earnings catalyst. So if you, so the, the idea is to look for a stock which is neglected and where there is a significant earnings catalyst that has come out in the recent quarter. And then you try to estimate, you know, okay, what exactly is happening here and what this, what the next few quarters are going to look like. And you go ahead and take that bet. So it is something that comes with experience. So, you know, I can do that Zoom call, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can't, uh, you'll have to do it yourself for a few quarters to really get a hang of, uh, uh, you know, how to, how to do it. But essentially the idea is very simple, just that it needs some experience in terms of uh, doing it for a few quarters. Right. So Prabhakar, client onboarding is a very important aspect. And if, if we are able to make uh, the the, uh, the clients understand the importance of uh, uh, the market behavior and portfolio allocation, that is, uh, I mean, half the battle. So, so uh, how had we experienced and understand about portfolio allocation and any challenges which you face uh, in, in such situations when... Uh, you you go through the process of client onboarding. No, see, we only ask for one thing. Okay, we ask our customers for their uh, liquidity, you know, uh, horizon, right? So we tell our customers that if you're coming to equity markets, come with a three to five year outlook. Anything below that, please. So we have refused a lot of capital also, whereby you know during good phases, a lot of you know hard, hard money tries to come in. So the only thing that we ask for our customers is time. That's all we ask for. And I don't believe that we should, uh, you know, get into the business of, uh, uh, you know, uh, really trying to explain too much to the customers, right? You have to give them a gist of the strategy so that, uh, you know, because see, ours is a business of two variables, right? Portfolio management is a business of two variables. One is trust and one is performance, right? And in our business, there is no hanky-panky. You can't uh, fool around. So numbers are right there in front of the client every month, every quarter, right? And the second is, uh, you know, trust in the fund managers that they will, you know, they have the capability and the skill set to deliver, right? So these are the two things, uh, you know, so we have to, you know, show the performance and, uh, you know, uh, that is what should, uh, you know, uh, speak for itself. Beyond that, uh, uh, like I said, I don't really believe in explaining everything in detail to customers. Like that is why we run discretionary PMS, right? So discretionary PMS is that the client will not interfere in what you're doing, right? Because if the client starts asking too many questions, then it introduces a big bias in the portfolio manager, which is bad for the portfolio manager and the client. So we typically avoid, you know, such conversations, uh, you know, so it's, it's like, uh, you know, trust in us and hope for the best. Great. So, growth cap, you can unmute and ask your uh, question, please. Yeah, thanks, Prince Ji, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, hope uh, we have a great week in hand. So, Prabhakar Ji, I have one question related to, since I am a, a like a value investor, uh, basically, I do invest in micro cap and a small cap. But my question is that how to uh, time the market if like if some... Uh, a script rallies like 200% and 300% within three months and four months. So how to basically, uh, you know, uh, 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 calculate the valuations and uh, be into that security until you see that, okay, now we have to uh, exit now. I'll give you the example. I was into, the, again, there's no buy and sell recommendations. I was into server tech. And I bought around uh, 60 rupees and it went to uh, around 183 rupees, right? So valuation seems like 200p, right? 
so in that case is how to tackle as you know that valuation is too too high i entered into the right valuations but it went to 200 pe so how to basically you know uh, i mean predict whether we should get out or whether we should uh, keep riding that you know winners no no see uh, so basically stocks like server tech it's a circuit stock right every day they're hitting a circuit more or less right if i'm not wrong i've seen the stock yeah that's true yeah, yeah. yeah. so true. see with these kind of stocks we should not be in under these uh, you know confusions that fundamental it's not going up because of fundamentals let's be very clear okay the fundamentals of course are there and you know on the it's a very small stock right it is is it a leader in the in the segment that it operates in right you know what is the float right how many institutions are there in the company right so fundamentally if you if you look at it right so this is not a, this is not a stock where we can discuss or debate numbers or valuation right so let us be very clear that it is a momentum stock it is probably a stock that is operated now i don't know about it but i am just telling you because of the daily circuits and all of that right so if you have that clarity of thought that i am dealing with a stock which is basically a small cap micro cap momentum stock right and uh, you know uh, fundamentals are there but at this point in time at 200 p fundamentals don't really matter right now there's no question of uh, you know figuring out whether 200 p is right or it should should it come back to 100 p right so fundamentals are completely out of question so here you have to take a purely trading approach and that is my personal view okay now the stock may become become a 100 bagger i don't know but you know uh, because i have not seen it in detail but broadly if you look at these parameters right you have to take a trading approach and uh, you know since you're sitting on a huge gain you have to definitely book some profits you have to but you have to always keep some part of the stock to you know ride for that you know that big one you know which nobody can predict where it will go if this bull market continues for 2 3 years but you have to periodically keep taking profits but not be in the delusion that you know the fundamental aspects are what is driving the stock something else is driving the stock so let's be clear on that you know so that's my point so don't chase the wrong parameter the right way to look at stocks like this is to look at it as a momentum stock have a trailing stop loss and uh, you know keep booking profits but always keep of some allocation to play for the big one that is how i would do it a uh, thank you prabhakar ji second question i'm really sorry so usually uh, i'm very new to the market but uh, i believe in learning so usually how long bull market remains i mean i i just wanted to know i mean based on your experience typically bull markets uh, last for anywhere between you know 3 to 5 years right uh, now depends on how you define the bull market right so some people say that from two th- no i'm asking i'm asking based on like india growth like prime minister says that it's our time it's india time and we have our one decade to grow and we will become like uh, third largest uh, economic uh, in the world like i'm considering those parameters like you know yeah and all that is correct but the see this one like since you're new to the market obviously you know it will take some time for you to understand these things but see this india growth story and all that is good you know a lot of capital is coming to india and all all that is a fact but essentially the entire global equity market moves together right and uh, us is the big daddy all said and done that is where the bulk of the liquidity and bulk of the capital is right so india it is it will very it's very unlikely that it will happen that only the indian stock market goes into a bullish phase and the rest of the world is uh, you know in in a bear market right so there are these cycles that happen in the market and there are global cycles these are nothing to do with india in specific right now india may outperform in, in some cycle underperform in some other cycle that's a different matter but generally it's a global equity market cycle which is driven by which is driven today by the global interest rates right interest rates in the large economies including our economy right so so these so these are cyclical and they are always one or two steps ahead of the fundamental growth right so they are ahead of uh, now if uh, india growth story is really going to you know take off for the next uh, uh, let's say 10 years then the stock market will discount it in 5 years 
for six years, right? The stock market, it will never happen that when India starts slowing down after 10 years, then the stock market will fall. The stock market will start going up even before it's apparent to, you know, people that we are, you know, we are in this big, you know, multi-year growth uh, trajectory and it will fall much before the actual growth slows down. So do not, uh, so, so just track the global cycles, right? And, and if you can see that even now in our market, right, we are finding it so difficult to break into all-time highs because the rest of the global market is not breaking into all-time highs. So unless the rest of the global market breaks into all-time highs or is on the verge of breaking the all-time highs, we will find it very difficult to do that, right? So it may happen that we break into all-time highs, go up 5% higher and, you know, settle there. But it is. It cannot happen that the Nifty goes from you know eighteen eight to twenty five thousand, and the S and P five hundred in the U S is where it is. That is not going to happen. So so it's it's so you have to track the global cycles. You have to track the global interest rate. Uh, you know global liquidity situations, global interest rate, and then form a view on you know where we are in the bull market. Right. So Parvez uh, Parvezi, you can go next. Hi, Prince. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Prabhakar. Lovely speaking with you again. Hi, Prabhakar. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Prabhakar, one question I had since you were talking about, uh, you know, neglected uh, neglected stocks and, and you look for an earnings catalyst in there. Um, so when you when we do see an earnings catalyst like we've, we've spoken about earlier and you've talked about earlier also, um, that happens to be a very good opportunity to buy into a stock. And a lot of times that will also correlate with a technical uh, uh, indicator or a technical buy. Uh, at the same time, what happens is uh, uh, there are times after the first earnings, uh, which are pretty phenomenal, there is a kind of a, a, a lull in the earnings in, in following quarters. Um, do you Do you look at holding on to it once you invested for continued growth in, in future quarters, or if you do see a depressed quarter coming up next, you would exit and then wait for another catalyst to come in in, in upcoming quarters? No, I would typically wait. I would typically give a company at least a couple of quarters because, like you said, it yeah. it, it often happens that uh, you know there's a very good quarter and then there is a bit of a you know a lull, and then yes. it, it follows it up again with one more good quarter, right? And uh, the yes. same the same can happen even in terms of the market price. Right? So you have a very good quarter, but the market doesn't react, right? And then yes. you have a very good quarter again, and then the market takes off. Right. So, yeah, so it's uh, so see, end of the day, you have to realize that these are real businesses, right? So these are businesses, uh, you know, uh, for variety of reasons, which include seasonality, which includes, uh, you know, the way in inv the way inventory has been moving in the system. You know, you cannot expect, uh, you know, you have to give that, you know, that benefit of doubt or you have to give that little bit of leeway to the company. Uh, you know, that uh, after a very good quarter, let's say where you've done 100 crore uh, EBITDA in the next quarter, if you're doing uh, 70 crore EBITDA, then I'm okay. I can wait, right? But yeah. after 100 crore EBITDA, you're going back to 20 crore EBITDA, then I'm concerned. So it is also the yes. magnitude of, uh, you know, change that matters. So if, right. if it is something within reasonable limits, I would I would wait. And more often than not, the company, you know, rewards you in the third quarter because you, you've been able to, you know, wait for that long. Uh, yes. Uh, however, if it is, it also depends on the type of company it is, right? So if it's a company where, where I know that the management is not shady and, you know, the management is not, uh, that, you know, that there are managements who play around with these numbers, right? If you keep watching correct, the numbers correct. in many quarters, you can find, figure it out, right? So there are, yes. there are managements who play around with these numbers. So... If it is, a, you know, a good company where the corporate governance history has been good and I have no reason to, you know, doubt, uh, you know, this kind of uh, manipulation and all of that in numbers, then I definitely give it one more quarter. But if it is some company yeah. where I am circumspect, uh, then I would probably, you know, not give it that leeway or give it a slightly lower allocation. Right. And, and in that case also, you would probably, uh, other than the management, you would also probably look at the fundamentals uh, 
uh, of the company whilst investing in these and selection of your stocks based on earnings uh, uh, as a catalyst uh, when they're when they're neglected uh, where the the fundamentals are really solid then that gives you that kind of a confidence to hold on to it a lot longer also right no ideally i am looking for a situation where the fundamentals are bad to start with right uh, when i say fundamentals okay. i mean the numbers right not right. not the corporate governance so right. ideally i want the fundamentals to be bad and i want this quarter to be that big delta quarter where the turnaround seems to be happening in terms of you know market expansion or in terms of top line growth and right. uh, you know so so if the fundamentals are already good then there is very little alpha left on the table for us so right so the selection you know is is more a function of uh, uh, you know the type of sector rather than you know so if it is a sector where other companies are also you know doing well then you know yeah. I, i have more reasons to give it a benefit of doubt for a bad quarter right Uh, if it is yes. a company which is a one off and other companies in the sector are not doing well then you know like i said i'll be more circumspect but my ideal situation is a uh, you know turn from bad fundamentals or very average fundamentals to something spectacular and you know right so, right yeah yeah great super thanks so much prabhakar thanks for this yeah thank you for your question so prabhakar like uh, we we are pretty well uh, done with the question so uh, although uh, digress a bit and uh, request uh, if, if you would like to uh, share uh, the uh, market outlook at current point in time otherwise uh, we can uh, wrap up for the day uh, no nothing i mean i i mean i know as much as all of you there is i mean i don't have any differentiated uh, view here so i think the corporate uh, i mean earnings uh, have been very robust in q4 and i think uh, you know a lot of uh, people are also talking about it q1 also is going to be a pretty decent quarter a lot of companies should see margin expansion because you know generally commodities have been you know on a downtrend over the last 3 uh, months right especially crude so i think we should see a decent amount of margin expansion in q1 but i think q1 margins uh, you know once uh, you know the q1 margins are printed uh, you know we might have to be a bit careful because if if super high margins are seen because already a lot of companies are showing very good top line growths right and if uh, super high margins come out in q1 then one has to be a bit careful to ensure that you are not in a you know a high margin you know like a topish margin kind of situation because even the top line will continue to grow if we get to a very high margin in one quarter then it then it the company takes three four quarters to sort of you know normalize and you know uh, do in the earnings number don't jump as fast right so i would play q1 with a with that in the back of my mind that if something is showing very high margins then peak margin type of a situation is something i'll be a bit careful of in from a medium term point of view right so prabhakar thank you so much for your time today it was uh, always great to have you and uh, you you always had a different perspective uh, to the discussion and uh, really uh, insightful for each and every one of us so those who joined late uh, make listen to the recording uh, i'll be uploading it soon on my youtube channel the link to which has already been pinned so if you are yet to subscribe you can uh, subscribe for such insightful sessions so hopefully uh, we will come again uh, with a with an interesting topic as and when situation demands so thank you so much uh, prabhakar and everyone who asked great questions and uh, the attendees who stayed us uh, for long uh, thank you so much thanks everyone and thanks for your patience thank you prince thanks good night everyone good night good night yeah.